This podcast is brought to you by Dragon Shield. Use code play to win 5 at the affiliate link down below for 5% off to help support the show. Welcome to the Play to Win podcast, where we talk about winning in CEDH. I'm Cam. And I'm Dylan. And today we're actually not talking about CDH. We're talking about Casual Commander. We've done this once before where we had a whole podcast talking about what Casual Commander wasn't. We were talking about how Casual Commander isn't, Fast Tutors and it's not, Mana Rocks and it's not, Efficient Counter Spells. This time we're going to focus more on what Casual is. We just had a game with the Nitpicking Nerds. I played my Gisa and Giralf deck. And we were just in a casual mood. We're thinking a little bit more about Casual. So we're going to talk about what casual is which is mainly theme theme is most important mindset mindset is also very important and balance these are specifically my things but i think cameron you you feel similarly about we them. share a lot of the same casual philosophies because we're in the same play group and we've kind of built our play group around a specific power level for our casual decks and just to reiterate if you haven't seen the last casual video that we did uh, make sure you go check that out also if you want to support us directly make sure you check us out on patreon as well but i do want to say uh, from that previous video something that we do in our casual decks is we do make sure that it is different enough from cedh that it's kind of its own experience that's the only thing i want to bring up yeah. from the previous video that i think is still going to be relevant in our conversation today yeah it's specifically not cdh we are specifically trying to not have the same play style and experience as we would in cdh yeah. but the three things that you mentioned again like we build our decks around the mindset that we're going to have the the balance between all of our casual decks and making sure that we're built around cohesive themes as well and before we get into all of that and what we think about all that i think we should talk about the decks that we play that we want to talk about today so that we can reference these decks as we talk about mindset balance and theme i think that's a great idea i'm bringing gisa and Giralf. that's the one that i'm talking about today i recently played it with uh the nitpicking nerds and it did really great spoilers i'm also talking about noble bailoth which is bailoth Baratil Entertainer and Noble Heritage, which is the background. Mia played the same commander pairing, but her deck is a little bit different than mine, so I kind of want to talk about maybe some of the differences. And then I'm also talking about Edgar Markov. I've talked about Edgar a little bit, but not exactly on the last podcast, and Edgar is, as of right now, my longest remaining single commander and my most favorite commander. I love vampires more than anything, so I just got, I'm excited to talk about it. What about you? Let's hear about your decks you're bringing today. So I played my Gliss of the Trader deck with the Nick Picky Nerds recently, which I did previously talk about. It's gotten a couple of upgrades recently, um, but I have two new decks as well. I have Aragorn, King of Gondor, uh, which is the way that I round out my color pie with Glissa, and then I have a Wart the Raid Mother deck that I recently put together as well. Yeah, that Wart deck is sick, because that one actually is kind of, I mean, it's technically doing something that does exist in CDH, but nothing like it. It's a Kind of a storm deck. I, I'm curious most to hear most about that deck because that's your newest one. It's really cool. It is, and it's the one I have the least amount of reps with it as well right now. So I'm excited to you know get to play it more and figure out more of what it can do as yeah. well too. Do you want to just say what Wart yeah. is? Because like three people know what Wart does. Yeah. So Wart the Raid Mother is four, and then two Gruel Hybrid for a legendary creature Goblin Shaman. She's a three three. When Wart the Raid Mother comes into play, put two one one red and green Goblin Warrior creature tokens into play each red or green instant or sorcery spell that you play has conspire which if you don't remember what conspire does you may tap two untapped creatures you control that share a color with it when you do copy it and you may choose new targets for that copy what are the themes of warts what is your main focusing themes what does everything serve in that deck so my main theme is storm something that i really like to do with decks is if there's a typical theme that you can play in specific colors that is very popular in certain colors and not really supported in other colors i really like playing those themes and colors that it's not really supported because i it's a fun way to kind of naturally power down your deck's power level gruel storm is not really anything that you see in any format really so i kind of wanted to lean in on that since gruel has the ability to copy instance to sorceries by tapping down creatures that share a color with the spell that you're casting it's kind of interesting because storm is like a cdh strategy but not storm like this storm in cdh looks like infinite normally that's how we're doing storm in cdh which is different than storm in other formats but 
But in this one, from what I've seen, you're casting like five or six spells and then casting the ooze that makes a whole bunch of copies of the ooze. Yeah, you, know you what get I mean? to play Eve. I'm running Empty the Warns as well. The the side theme to this deck is a token strategy since Wart makes tokens. And I want to have a critical mass of creatures so that I can conspire all these spells that I'm casting. So I want to make sure that I have a bunch of tokens. So that's my backup theme, which also means then I can play like triumph of the hordes as a win condition in the deck and give all my tokens multiple instances of plus one plus one and, and infect and even though infect doesn't stack still stacking up my board with extra triumph of the hordes seems pretty cool yeah definitely it's kind of interesting because you're not using storm i mean this is gonna sound strange but it doesn't seem like you're using storm as a finisher you're using it more like a value engine you know what i mean like you're using the empty warrens to make a bunch of tokens so that you can double up your harmonize with the uh the ability that ward gives it you know with what i mean Spire, yeah. Exactly. So like you're, you're drawing six cards for four mana. That's your storm payoff. It's not like you're shooting the whole, you're not grape shotting people. And even if you were, that'd be pretty impressive if you could naturally storm up to grape shot 120 damage. I don't damage. think the deck has the ability to get to 120 no. damage yeah. with grape shot. But what it does have the ability to, to do is like make a bunch of mana and then play, um, is it, oh shit. I should know the names of the cards in the deck, but it's the most... Recent deck that I put together, so I'm still trying to learn all of it. Crackle with power? Crackle with power. Like, if you have enough mana and you can copy Crackle with power, like, that's kind of... It's not infinite. Right. It's not like I'm doing an infinite grape shot, but it's still like a very impressive way that you can finish the table then. To me, from my personal perspective, it has felt like fair storm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. if that if such a thing were to exist, this deck can kind of do that fair storm where more often than not, you're drawing extra cards, you're using a lot of removal stuff, but eventually if you're left alone long enough, you'll be able to copy a crackle with power for 10 or something and kill a day. That's the thing. Yeah, I can get wrathed really easily. I fall apart to all of the natural things that that token decks typically typically fall apart too. I'm a storm deck that wants to get its six mana commander out and <laughs> then storm off. So like right. I feel like I need rituals and then rituals upon that. So it, it feels like it's in a really good space. Your theme is storm, but also tokens. Yes. Your mindset going in. What's your what's your like mindset with the deck? I mean, I feel like we kind of talked about that a little bit, but I think my mindset is pretty similar to all of my decks, where my mindset is I'm trying to win the game, but I'm not trying to do anything that's like overtly super powerful every single game. Like I want to be able to pop off from time to time, and I don't want to necessarily play like i'm gonna be the threat either yeah. I, I think my main goal with casual a lot of the times when building the decks is i don't want them to win all the games but i just want them to be able to play every game i want to yeah. be able to formulate a game plan and have the decks run smoothly i don't want a ton of games where i'm missing early land drops or a ton of games where i'm flooding on mana i want to make sure that the deck can continue to make game actions throughout the whole game that's that's the main goal above making the deck as efficient as possible Exactly. Yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm at with it. Should I talk about one of my decks now? Please. Yeah. Kisa and Giroff. Let's start there. I just recently played just that played one. It, yeah. it did pretty well. This deck acts kind of interesting for a casual deck. This isn't a play style that I'm normally familiar with. The main goal of this deck above everything, it is a zombie themed deck. That's the theme. That's what we're doing as many zombies as possible. That's the main goal. We want to play zombies. We want them in the graveyard. Gisa and Giroff can put them in the graveyard. Should I say what Gisa and Giroff does? Gisa and Giralf is too generic and blue and a black for a legendary creature human wizard that says when it enters the battlefield, mill four cards. During each of your turns, you may cast a zombie creature spell from your graveyard, and it's a 4-4. So obviously, my main theme with Gisa and Giralf is zombies. Zombies is the goal. Zombies is what we do. Our secondary theme is self-mill. I want to put stuff in the graveyard specifically with blue cantrips, stuff like Thought Scour, Ooh. stuff like Careful Study, stuff like Forbidden Alchemy, where I can put stuff into the graveyard, I can find the things that I want, I can find Find the land drops because I'm not playing a ton of ramp in this deck. I don't really want to get ahead on mana. I want to get ahead on cards for the early game. I want to put stuff from my library into my graveyard. And then eventually the goal is to cast something like a zombie apocalypse. Once I've milled all my zombies into the graveyard, bring them back all at once. And the amount of ETBs and effects and value that I can gain from that in theory, is the way, is like the win. That's the win condition. Yeah, exactly. You're you're going for the long game, it sounds like. So you don't need the ramp. You just need to make sure that you're hitting your land drops because that's how you stay up. Yeah, and like I do have some ramp. I do have talismans and I have the charcoal and the sapphire diamonds and the two mana rocks. The I'm a big ones, fan of those. Yeah, yeah but... 
my overall goal with a lot of decks is to eventually get rid of those. For me, eventually, I want the deck to every single card to serve one of the main themes. There's normally two or three themes in a deck for me. Eventually, I would like every card in the deck to serve that theme, which would mean removing the charcoal diamond. But for now, what's most important is for the deck to hum. And until we get some more support for zombies, like, like zombie needs any more support because it's already very busted in Casual Commander eventually we can, I can remove some of those things. I've thought about even stuff like Search for Escanta, which yeah. doesn't get a lot of actual cards from the deck because I have like over 30 zombies, so it's not going to hit on the flip side a lot. But just the fact that it is a two-mana thing that will eventually turn into a land, that's kind of ramp, and it also surveils as I go. So I'm looking towards more of that type of effect going forward with Geese Angel, if that makes sense. I think that makes perfect sense because that's, again, a way that you can kind of use it as ramp by making sure that you're hitting your land drops with surveilling one every single Bingo. turn so like it's doing the same thing that a talisman would be doing for you basically but it's kind of working in your deck a little bit better yeah and in fact they can also find the zombie apocalypse specifically that's also great that's since also that's the key true. of the deck instead of taking a turn off to talisman on turn two you're taking your turn two to set yourself up for the rest of the game, yes. which I guess the Talisman does too, but... It's a little bit different. It feels worse. Yeah, the the ramp kind of counteracts itself if you start missing your land drops later on, which is why I, recently I've been kind of coming more around to casuals. What's most important is I just want to hit my land drops every turn for 10 turns because by turn 10, if I'm still alive and I have 10 mana in play, the other decks are probably also going to have 10 mana in play. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. they're going to ramp early, so they're going to get to six mana on turn three, but if they don't hit their land drops, eventually they'll level out and we'll be back on the same level. And since I've been drawing the whole time and I've been cantripping and I've been filling up my graveyard, so long as the graveyard doesn't get exiled, yeah. theoretically, the game plan is I will be ahead by that point. You know what? We're going to we're gonna shove this into the podcast here, this shove section it. of the podcast here. Let's talk about how many lands we're playing Ooh. in our casual decks. Because I think you run more than me typically. 36. Oh, you run 36. 36 is the set, is the uh, starting point for every casual deck. Okay, because from the way you've been talking, I would have assumed that you're that you've moved up to like 38 or 40 in your decks now to ensure that you're hitting land drops more consistently. So I'm counting 36 only lands on the front side. In that I'm not counting the modal DFCs, the cards that are spells on one side but flip into lands. I like having around two of those per deck. Too. I see. So you're you're technically still at 38. Right. Yeah, it's 36, 38, somewhere in that ballpark, depending on what you count. With Geese and Giroff specifically, I can tell you, I think I do only run 36 i know glissa only has 36 and 36 is usually the number that i just stay on but i'm starting to consider different numbers depending on the theme of my deck as well yeah so like 36 is still the goal but with a deck like geese and Drop where i'm drawing so much it's much more easier to hit those land jobs because theoretically i'm casting a cantrip like every other turn but for all of my decks i'm playing 36 except for rafik which i talked about last time rafik is playing like 37 lands just because there's like dryad arbor and a couple of like weird lands a couple of creature lands that come in tapped and stuff like that the mana base is a little shaky so up a land from there and then my ac land deck that i talked about last time also has like 45 lands or something like that i see yeah yeah exactly yeah that's another that's a land that's a lands deck. deck you yeah, want that yeah. exactly yeah i would love to get to a point with the themes in my deck where like i can start making the lands matter more to the theme but i don't think there's enough critical mass of lands that i can make it all work out like maybe uh, part of what i'm thinking is maybe i want to make sure that all of the basic lands in glissa have some sort of an artifact in them like the brothers war ones the Brothers War uh, basic lands that have, like, the, the big mechs in them. Like, I feel like I should be... Ex I should have to use those lands in this artifact base. I'm deck. a big fan of that too. I think basic lands are super important. Trying to find the art that matches the theme perfectly is super fun. For my Edgar deck, I use the secret layer vampire ones because they're perfect. They're just for it. For Gisa and Giroff, I have some in mind. But I want to use the islands from that same secret layer vampire set yeah. because it's really cool. But there's not a full art swamp that has a zombie on it. There is a non full art that was like a secret layer that has mm, some zombies on okay, it. Okay. But yeah. I haven't found the perfect swamp. So for now, I'm just doing each land is a different full art swap you know what yeah. i mean but another eventually, stipulation yeah. i'm sorry to interrupt no it's okay another stipulation is all of my basics have to be full art i'm not playing any non-full art basics in my decks interesting at all as a matter of fact all basics should just be full art i don't know why we're still printing non-full art basics in general i will interject and say beta basics are fucking awesome and they're not full art 
Also, I will say my AC deck plays Snowlands, and I use the original Snowlands because I like the original art of stuff, especially yeah. that Snow Island with the faces on I it. I think is that's cool. fair, but like now, in 2024, why are we still printing full art lands next to non full art lands? Why am I opening packs of magic cards that are now $7.99, $6.99? And have a regular land in and it. And I'm opening a regular ass fucking land so, in there. So you want all basics to be full art going forward? All basics should be full art. First of all, beginners yeah. will have a significantly easier time identifying you what your mana sources are in your opening hand. Oh, so okay. it makes your opening hands, like in draft, a lot easier to understand because the borders are completely different for your mana sources. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. For your non-dual mana sources, I should say. I don't know if there's any science to back that up. That's fair. I don't know. I like the the ability to choose different art, art styles and frame styles, but Magic has definitely gone overboard with that. I don't think small frame basics are going anywhere. I'm going to tell you that right now, but I I do I do like full That's art stuff. So yeah. It's 2024. <laughs> packs we are get rid 6 99 now. I should get a full art foil ass basic in every pack I open. Yeah, that's fair. Especially it costs with the pack zero dollars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, now that I can cut that up into a short, let's <laughs> <laughs> move on. Thank you for taking that little sidetrack with Absolutely. me about lands. The other main thing that we're doing in Gisa and Giralf is Rooftop Storm. This card is where things get a little bit broken in this deck, and we start blurring some lines. Now, there is no world at all in which Gisa and Giralf could be considered a CDH deck. It's just not even close on anything that it's doing to CDH whatsoever. But with Rooftop Storm and Gravecrawler and Grim Grin, which is a sack outlet, and a payoff that does any benefit when a zombie enters or leaves the battlefield, technically, with those four cards, we got a loop there. At this point, I'm okay with that because all of those cards directly support the theme in a really big, strong way. And I don't have to go for that. Like, I don't have to go through the loop every time. You know what I mean? Just because it's there doesn't mean that you have to do it. It's something that I like to make sure I check with the table beforehand. Hey, guys, is, is it okay if I have the loop in there? I won't go for it. Or just see how the table feels. Sometimes casual players will go, yeah, four cards. That's fine. That's not a big deal. And I kind of feel that way too, but I don't want to ruin anyone's experience by out of nowhere just slamming Rooftop to Storm on turn six and going for a win. As unlikely that as that is because it's four cards, theoretically it's possible. I think part of casual EDH is that people know that there are certain cards that you just play in a lot of different themes. And I think that the zombie decks... Are we are recording? Yeah. <laughs> Thank God. Okay. If you go up against a zombie deck, you kind of expect that Rooftop Storm is going to be in there. So I think that we're not going like so far outside of player expectations that I think it would upset folks if like yeah. that just happens to be in there because four of these really good zombie cards are really good with Rooftop Storm in play, but it uh, the combo fucking sucks if you don't have Rooftop Storm out. So. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. As long as everything fits the theme, I'm cool with it. That's kind of my feeling on combos and casual for right now. Do you want to tell me about another one of your casual decks? Yeah, so I haven't talked about Aragorn, King of Gondor, on yeah. the channel before. When we did the last video, we talked about some decks that we might want to build from the Lord of the Rings set, and none of them that we talked about came together. This Aragorn I really liked because it's it's kind of like a Jeskai Queen Marchesa enters the battlefield. You can make the Monarch, and now I can build a Jeskai deck around that. But I really like Aragorn's other ability, too. I didn't want to, like, necessarily be a Monarch deck specifically. Sure. I kind of wanted that to be a secondary theme where I can play the blink spells like ephemerate and get back the monarchy really easily should we read aragorn since there's a thousand different there parts are, that are yeah, of it anyway that are called aragorn yeah so this aragorn in particular king of gondor is one a blue a red a white for a four four human noble with vigilance and lifelink when it enters the battlefield you become the monarch and when it attacks up to one target creature can't block this turn if you're the monarch creatures can't block this turn so I wanted to build this deck more around that second line of text instead of necessarily being just a monarchy deck. So I'm still playing like Ephemerate and all the good one mana blink cards so that I can easily get back the monarchy if I lose it. But I built this deck around creatures that have some sort of trigger either when they attack or when they deal combat damage because Aragorn makes it stupid easy to get in for combat damage so i want to like take advantage of a bunch of things that just hit players draw cards do some other kind of effect make me treasures i, I lean in a lot on legendary creatures i kind of wanted this also like this noble sub theme which was really hard to do 
uh, good. A lot of the nobles <laughs> are just like really not bad, good, and yeah. they're just not good. And it kind of then conflicted with the attack trigger thing then too, because not a lot of nobles have an attack trigger. So I, I leaned more in on the combat focus of the deck, and I've really liked this. It. it feels like wins just kind of fall together like I'm, yeah. m- if i actively keep attacking people and if people keep actively progressing the game you can get wins just because your creatures aren't blockable aragorn makes your creatures not blockable you can suit up your creatures with some things to make them even stronger and just get in for a ton of damage so it's kind of like my voltron deck without being a voltron deck okay so interesting so like your main theme you would say is like monarch or is it like etbs and combat damage triggers it's attacking it's, it's attacking. not really et really the only etb that i'm built around is aragorn's okay. etb there's like no other etbs that matter to me in this deck it's really more about uh, the attack triggers. So your goal is getting and maintaining the monarch as well as attacking efficiently. Yes. Those are your main goals you're trying to serve in Jeskai Colors. Yeah, trying to build around Aragorn's second ability, okay. which forces me to build around monarchy a little bit more, but the cards in the deck, like the creatures in the deck, are more focused on... The, they're all creatures that like want to get in. Are you playing any equipment or anything like that? There's a couple. Like I'm, a couple. I'm playing Umazawa's Jite. Okay. Seems like kind of the perfect equipment for the deck, but I'm not running a ton of equipment. I do run Flowering of the White Tree in the deck as well as the other way to pump my creatures since I'm, I, I kind of wanted to focus on that noble theme. It kind of turned into more of a, hey, a lot of these creatures are legendary creatures, so it gives most of the creatures in my deck plus two, plus one, and ward one. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I love that. Sounds great. Yeah, it's a pretty cool deck. My Noble Baloth deck is a little bit more similar to your deck than it is to Mia's deck. Um, Mia, when we played against the Nitpicky Nerds, her deck was a little bit more go-wide, a little bit more artifact strategy, kind of basing more off of the treasures that Baloth enters, triggering a couple things and stuff like that. My deck does have a little bit of that, but I'm focusing more on sweepers and control. I'm looking to really focus on forced combat and specifically using the initiative to gain advantage with that. A lot of the initiative creatures I've been really impressed with in casual they're really strong they really help you make your land drops they really just like help the boros deck do boros things throughout the entirety of the game that's my main honestly the main theme of this noble bailout deck is just like showing off new boros strengths the new white cards have been good the new some of the new red cards have been good as well so i'm trying to do that specifically when it comes to creatures around the monarch and around initiative but i'm also focusing on some control elements which is a little bit confusing because in one way i'm a little bit creature heavy but i'm also playing things like terminus and blasphemous act and really efficient board wipes that red white has access to because i want to use like the strength of the whole color pair i don't want to leave anything out because boros still i think is kind of a weaker color pair even though it's gotten so much when it comes to casual commander simic is still going to dominate over boros the green stuff is still going to be bigger and better so i want to use everything that boros kind of has access to and that a lot of times is stuff like blasphemous act but when i compare it with things like boros reckoner or other things like gisela where i'm cutting the damage in half so the the damage done to my things by my earthquakes is half but double to other people i'm trying to focus on stuff like that and gisela is also great because it is really helpful with the forced combat making other people attack each other so that i can keep the initiative and i can keep the monarch I am actually very scared of this deck because it forces everyone to play differently and you get protection from us if we try to do things that are advantageous for us so that we don't get messed up by what your commander does. I should say what the commanders do. Read them. I am playing Baloth Baratel Entertainer, which is four in a red for a legendary creature elf shaman that says creatures your opponents control with power less than Baloth's power are goaded. Whenever a goaded attacking or blocking creature dies, you create a treasure token and it has choose a background, which means that you can play an enchantment background as your secondary commander. Mine that I chose is Noble Heritage, which is one in a white for a legendary enchantment background that it says commander creatures you own have when this creature enters the battlefield and at the beginning of your upkeep each player may put two plus one plus one counters on a creature they control for each opponent who does you gain protection from that player until your next turn that part is super relevant because a lot of times players will want to make their things bigger so that they can avoid their stuff getting goaded but if they do make their stuff bigger they can't attack you anyway they have to go to someone else so they're kind of goaded anyway because you have protection from them and there's many times where it's you're the player that I want to attack because right. you're fucking up my board and I have to play in a weird way. We have kind of learned that it's almost always best to just not take the counters, but that's sometimes that's not the case. You know what it, I mean? It, depends it really on depends. Your deck. Like Glissa 
likes taking the counters because I only really want one creature in play that doesn't have to attack, and then I have a first strike death toucher that people won't want to attack into me but like aragorn doesn't like that as much right <laughs> like, yeah exactly if you need the creature to block it's a little bit helpful but if you want to be doing damage and the player who's ahead you can't deal damage to that'll make all your plans go a little bit backwards but it's a very cool deck i really like that deck oh thank you yeah it does yeah. play a lot of cards that i think are probably just not good but i like them for nostalgic reasons stuff yeah. like restoration angel is like a perfect example i like blinking creatures with initiative because you can gain the initiative right back when they enter and stuff like that over Overall, Resto was probably a little bit underpowered in Casual Commander, but I still love it. I'm playing things like Wall of Omens and Lauren of the Third Path to have a couple extra ETBs. Since the initiative is the main goal of the deck, when the initiative goes all the way through, I want a good target to hit off of the top 10 cards that's going to enter with the three counters and the Hexproof. So I want a couple of extra creatures, and then in the early game, a lot of those creatures serve as just like deterrence don't attack me i have this thing i'm gonna chump it to block i'm gonna get rid of it with that and just use them to stay alive and in the end game after a wrath slam something like gisela or a sun titan or inferno titan and win once everyone's out of resources i really like that so your your main theme you would say is main theme is forced combat forced combat specifically in the initiative in monarch sp specifically there yeah as well as boros control so I'll just kind of use Boros Control as another one of the themes. Sometimes I feel like a theme can just be style of deck. It just serves the style of deck, which is just on um, Boros Control. I want I don't have card advantage, so I want my Blasphemous Act to kill 10 creatures. There's my card advantage. The style of deck, like with Wart, Storm. Like there's just going to be cards in there that go with Storm, and Storm is just part of that strategy. The nice part about theme and the nice part about casual EDH is that theme is such a broad term, you can make it mean anything. Theme can be, I want to build a deck around Skyrim without using <laughs> Skyrim cards because yeah. I'm sure we're going to get them in the future. Ooh, that'll be fun. Actually, yeah. But and like theme can be a, a, a card type, an artifact, right? Theme can be basically whatever you can build a magic deck around, which is super nice. Yeah, and I try my best to make things not be in there just based off of efficiency. So like in this deck, even though I'm in Boros Control, I won't play Swords to Plowshare because it's really just the most efficient removal, but I will play Path to Exile because I play Tithe. And if an opponent has more lands than me because I path to exile the creature and I give them a land, I can get two planes now. So there are things like that where as long as I can find a synergy within one of the main themes of the deck, some kind of edge, I'm, I'm into it. I like that. You know what I mean? So like for Blasphemous Act, I'm playing Boros Reckoner and I'm playing Gisela. Like I said before, I'm playing Archangel Avacyn, which can give Indestructible when it enters. Yes, it does. It does. So yeah. you know what I mean? There's like ways that you can pair it with other things that it'll synergize and do cool stuff, but I'm not going to play... Something like, um, I can't think of a single example of a good card, Dranith Magistrate. Although Dranith would be a great control option in any Boros control deck, I'm not playing that because it doesn't fit the theme and that's just a CDH card. For, so for me, I want I, that, that's what I'm looking for. Great, yeah, I love that. Would you have a third deck you want to talk about? I do. Well, it, well we won't talk about it too much because I talked about it on the channel before, but Glissa the Trader is my my commander, my casual EDH. That's your deck, deck. Yes. yeah. So Glissa the Trader is green, green, black for a 3-3 three, three zombie elf. I need to remember that the, that she's a zombie more. I'm playing Noxious Cool a lot recently, yeah, so, so yeah, I definitely I, I need to that's keep on me that too. in mind. Yeah. <laughs> so she's a first strike death toucher, which is the, the two best keywords you could have. Whenever a creature an opponent controls is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you may return target artifact card from your graveyard to your hand so this card is best known for getting psychomancer back from my graveyard to my hand but it can also do things with like urza's and mishra's bobble to draw a bunch of cards and a, a lot of the other famous eggs that you've seen in modern before like that this deck really loves to see a lot of other just general value pieces like casting solemn similar chromaton this deck gets absolutely busted when you have shimmer mirror as well because now you can start flashing in these bobbles on other players turns and having them you draw two cards a turn instead of just one off these bobbles there's a lot of really unique synergy in here the main themes of the deck kill spells is basically the main theme of the deck this is basically a, a heavy removal deck really i guess the theme is pretty much glissa yeah like the, the deck is just built around glissa as best as it could be for me yeah from the outside in it seems like you're main themes are one artifacts that sacrifice themselves or have value when they leave or enter the battlefield and then creatures dying i think that's your other theme because your deck benefits 
a lot from when other decks are just attacking each other and something dies in Cobb and you're like, haha, I will get my little Mistress Bobble back or something like that. And then your removal spells really help serve that theme of creatures dying. That's exactly. how it looks like to me. And there's other cards in the deck that like give, let me draw cards when other creatures die too. So there's other things that I'm trying to do to like trigger that as well. So what about new stuff? Cause I know recently with the 40 K, the Warhammer set, yeah. I feel like you got some juice specifically that one four mana creature. Do you know the one I'm talking about? I do know the one that you're talking about. Let me get it out so that we can, we can read this card and talk about it a little bit more. It's very new. I haven't been able to cast it yet. Imotech the Storm Lord. I'm going to read this card because it's it's very unique. Uh, it's a 3-3 three, three for 2 and 2 black. It says whenever one or more artifacts leave your graveyard, create 2 2-2 two, two black Necron artifact creature tokens. Uh, which is pretty busted. Like, this whole deck is based around trying to get artifacts back. One of you tr trigger Glissa, make two two twos. It also says, at the beginning of combat on your turn, another target artifact creature you control gets plus two, plus two, and gains menace until end of turn. It itself is an artifact creature as well. So, if it dies, Glissa can get it back. There's a lot of other cards in that set that I've played before that I'm not playing now. One of the Necrons is a five mana ETB destroy a creature in mill three. That's on an artifact creature. So, it's just another way that you can do everything everything that you want to do yeah definitely it seems like and I, as with the, all the commanders we're talking about today the main goal of the decks are just to play magic the, the winning part is secondary and sometimes i have to remember that that mindset is like the biggest difference between yeah. cdh and casual in cdh i'm playing to win that's what i want to do and sometimes it takes me a second if i make suboptimal plays in casual commander to go that doesn't matter it's fine it doesn't all have to be optimal i don't have to always do the correct play it's it's really okay i'm really just trying to relax right now it's hard to get out of that. I'm a pretty competitive person, yeah. so it is tricky, but I try to remind myself that often of like, my goal is to play the game. If I cast the spells and if I hit my land drops and am I interacting with my opponents and stuff like that, if I make a mistake, that's all right. I just got to move past it. And that should be the same in CDH too, but I'm competitive. I want to make the most optimal play every time. So that's tricky. No, it's the exact same way for me where I, I want to be there to do the interactions that I like to do in games of magic. And in casual, if I'm doing those things, then I'm good. And that's something that I need to i just i'm always trying to retell myself because again i'm just like you i'm more competitive yeah I, I still like to win but i just don't care if i don't win these games as much exactly do you have another deck you want to talk about one more edgar markov oh yes I haven't spoken about him yet i've talked about edgar a little bit in the past but edgar's gotten a lot of juice recently right now the main goal of this deck for me vampires i'm big into kindred type i'm big into specific creature type themes i have a vampires deck i have a zombies deck i have a werewolves deck tovalar i'm not talking about that today but i'll talk about it another time that deck sucks uh but <laughs> that, i'm really big into that and this edgar deck is the longest standing deck that i've had it was the deck that got me back into commander when i first got back into commander this is the deck that i built and i just went right off this right from the pre-con but recently it's got a ton of stuff that's made me shift it a little bit so i'm not playing stuff like skull clamp which for me any you Years was a staple for me for this deck because my main secondary goal besides vampires is go wide. I want to make my vampires bigger and more of them, and I want to create more. So I don't want to have things that require me to get rid of my vampires to gain value. Yes, Skull Clamp is broken. Yes, it would probably increase the win percentage of my deck if I put it in there, but it doesn't really serve that theme of going wide. No, it's an aristocrat's card. Exactly. So like, instead of Skull Clamp, I play something like Idol of Oblivion that says whenever a token enters, tap it. No, it says tap it to draw a card, activate only if a token enters. So that's like my third theme besides going wide. I mean, I guess it's part, it's sub part of theme two is specifically with tokens. Edgar makes a bunch of vampire tokens. There's a bunch of other cards that make vampire tokens. So we're doing vampires. We're specifically going wide with tokens. And also the other theme of the deck is using life a little bit as a resource. So because so many vampires naturally have lifelink and I have so many accidental ways to kind of gain life in the deck, I'm playing things like a uh, champion of dusk. I call this deck Edgar farm because in a lot of ways it plays similarly to a farm deck in cdh but in many ways it doesn't the only ways it does is i'm you playing a lot of creatures i'm gaining some life and then i'm spending that life to draw a whole bunch of cards and champion of dusk is like perfect because it fits with the go wide strategy because the wider i get the more cards i draw and it's just also like the best one of the best cards in the deck right also things like fire covenant which is a great removal spell if i have extra life which with this deck i often do because of the lifelink so 
that's the I would say that's like the third main theme of the deck is is life uh life use basically for advantage. Yeah, this deck has been your baby for such a long time and it's really become super fine tuned. I really love it. And recently I've also tried to step away from things like Teferi's protection, which for a long time was also another staple of the Just deck. Like a, a, a staple of the format, exactly. of the casual format. But really. what Teferi's protection does is it makes me leave up three mana. And I'd much rather just spend that three mana on vampires. So what I've done recently is instead of trying to protect my board, I want more ways to rebuild my board. And we've gotten some vampires recently that help that. The big one is Queen Bay's Paladin, which is effectively Sun Titan for vampires. Love that. Whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks, return up to one target vampire card from your graveyard to the battlefield with a finality counter on it, which means if it dies, you were to get exiled and you lose life equal to its mana value. So it serves on a lot of themes. It's the vampires. We got that because it's bringing back a vampire, but it's also using the extra life as a resource to bring the vampire back. Really good card to help rebuild the board. And then the second one is Redemption Choir, which is another mini Sun Titan for vampires, basically. It's a four mana 3-3 three, three with lifelink that, set, that has Coven. So whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks, if you control three or more creatures with different power, return target permanent card with mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Three different powers is not that tricky because with Edgar, you're making a 1-1. One, one, so all you need is a 2-2 two, two or a 4-4, four, four, and there's a ton of 2-2s two, in the deck. And three mana permanents, there's like 21 drops in this deck. So you're always going to have something at the very least. And then at the very most, you'll get something bigger and better back. Another real quick one that I, I know I'm like really fucking rambling on a lot of good this cards. This is your deck, man. Go for it. Another one that I want to talk about that really changed the whole landscape of this deck, Blood Letter of Aklazots, which is a one black, black, black for a flying demon vampire 2-4 that says if an opponent would lose life during your turn, they lose twice that much life instead, which really helps with the aggro part of this deck. I've taken out things like Necropotence and Bolus Citadel, which is cards that I used to have in this deck and replace them with more ways to just deal damage. I don't want to focus quite as much on drawing a lot of cards and getting some sort of vampire combo just going. Just being like a good vampire deck. Exactly. You want to be a vampire deck that's really good. Right, yeah, exactly. So I'm not playing the combo. There's a combo with Oathsworn Vampire and Phyrexian Altar. Not playing those cards. Phyrexian Altar, again, I don't want to get rid of my vampires. I want to use them for value. I want more ways to kill my opponents. So along with adding the Blood Letter for extra damage, I also recently put in Shared Animosity. It's a little mini coat of kind arms of does the same thing exactly more ways to deal damage to my opponents is what i'm looking for this deck and it's gotten pretty good at it it can a lot of times just kill the table on turn like five i mean i don't need to explain to you that edgar is a broken commander it's one of the most popular decks and a whole lot of people have worked on it but my list is pretty good so it was just a little quick spin through of some of our casual decks that we've been playing Casual Commander is cool. It's a lot different from CDH in a lot of different ways. In a lot of ways, it is similar, though. I've definitely taken some ideas from Casual Commander and said, hmm, I wonder if I should try that in CDH. But overall, I love Casual Commander. I think it's in a great spot right now, even with the additions of all the new powerful cards in the format. We've been pretty good at self-regulating. We play the cards that we want to yeah, play. I really like how our pod is time to it. So, EDH Rec puts out a list every single year of the saltiest cards in the format where actual real-life commander players vote on the cards in the format that make them the angriest when they see them in play okay. in commander. And we are going to judge everyone based on the salt list on this website i love it let's get to it do you want to go just through the top 10 or do you want to start it with like the saltiest card and move down let's start at number 10 and go up can you do that yeah let's start at number 10 and I go up. i think let's do that number 10 is dockside extortionist oh this sure. is the 10th saltiest card in edh yeah which I, is funny because this is probably like the number two saltiest card in ced yeah <laughs> <laughs> i get it i mean if there was a dockside played in my casual pod i would probably go what are you doing i'd you raise know? an eyebrow i'd raise an eyebrow yeah. i don't know about salty dockside is a little bit worse than casual commander i definitely I would say. agree with that yeah yeah. So it probably would be a little bit closer to fine, but I know I wouldn't be playing Dockside in a casual deck just because of what it means to me. I totally agree with that. You won't see me playing it in a casual pod, but Jill's joining us now. Number nine is Obliterate. This one we should read. This is six and two red for a sorcery that can't be countered. It says destroy all artifacts, creatures, and lands. They can't be regenerated. I, to an extent, understand why this type of card would make players salty somewhat. I get it. The farewells of the format are powerful, and people don't like getting all their stuff removed. I try really hard to not look at magic this way, because no matter what, even though my goal is to do my thing, it's still not my opponent's responsibility to make sure that I get to do the thing, even in casual commander. Even though, yes, we should all be having fun, I should be thinking about what's going on, 
Yeah. Now there is an extent if the obliterate comes out of nowhere, I might go, Oh God, I wish I knew that you were playing obliterate. You know what I mean? I would have saved some lands in my hand. Right. Like I, but, but sometimes that happens and that's okay. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't have to be an issue. The difference between like this and a farewell is that this gets rid of the lands too, and just makes it really hard to come back. So it really does do a hard reset of the game with your life totals adjusted. Farewell just means that. So it allows someone else to catch up. That's all it does is allow someone else to get back in the game and catch up. Whereas this is like completely different. This is a hard reset. And I think the main issue comes down to just like conceding is more frowned upon in casual commander. If I was in a regular game of modern or something and someone blew up, they annihilated me with an Emrakul and got rid of all my permanents. I wouldn't keep on playing the game and say, oh, this is so much not fun. You have, you know what I mean? I would just say, you got me. Let's go to the next one. But in casual commander, because it's four player, it doesn't really work that way. So like in situations where you should just be able to scoop and say, yep, you got me i'm not coming back from this one you're almost like forced to stay in the game and just like draw past draw past draw past land draw past land you know what i mean the, that stinks I, the pro the difference is that in modern you're winning with the emrakul yeah because they fetch shock themselves and they're down to 17 and then like you put them to two and they have no permanence in play and like you're gonna be able to get another Emer emrakul into play later right you're winning the game but a lot of times like the game doesn't get actually won until much later and that play Player might not even be winning the game after they do that thing. Do you think this card's a salty card? Do you think it deserves a spot on the list? I think it disturbs on a sp the spot on the list underneath, way like way lower than Dockside Extortionist. So you think it's less salty? Than I think it's less salty than Dockside. Okay. I think yeah, fair. probably. What do you think? I get why it's more salty. It damages yeah. the game. I understand commander players' mindset with this one a little bit more. I don't have the same mindset, but I get it. Like, I get it. You just spent a whole bunch of time crafting your perfect board state, and with one card, everyone, someone just destroys every single person's board state. It doesn't even present a win condition after that. I agree with you. If they could have just played the Emrakul and had a 15-15, it'd be a little bit different. But since they often also have nothing after that, that stinks. That stinks. Yeah, exactly. Should we move on to the next one? All right, the next one is Expropriate. Ooh. This is seven and two blue for a sorcery that says, starting with you, each player votes for time or money. For each time vote, take an extra turn after this one. For each money vote, choose a permanent owned by the voter and gain control of it. Exile, expropriate. I think the reason why this one is salty is because people don't realize that you shouldn't give someone three extra turns. And no, you, you should just be giving just away give a, a uh, permanent. Your, the worst thing that you have. Well, no, they choose it, I think. Choose a permanent owned by the voter and gain control of it. So you, the expropriator caster, chooses a permanent I guess owned that's by the true, voter. Yeah. So you get to take their best thing. You got to get rid of your best thing as opposed to giving them the extra turns. I don't think expropriate is a salty card. I like the idea of turns decks being able to use it. This is another one where you should talk to your table. And if your opponent says, I have five extra turns stacked up, you can all go, hey, we can concede, right? Like yeah. we know that we're dead here and scoop them up. Honestly, this don't is this is a don't. win condition. Like yeah. decks need to win the game at some point. And if I'm spending nine fucking mana on a spell i better be good at getting a damn good effect on it and yeah. not getting like some sort of makeshift worm coil engine or some shit yeah this is at least a win this will help you get to a win more easily than obliterate will help you get to a win i don't think this card is salty at all i have no issue with this card turn spells i don't have a problem with as long as the player is moving quickly what yeah. i don't like is when someone says okay i'll untap my I'll draw. Lands. Hmm, yeah. Let me think. Let me think. Let me think. Let me think. Cast Expropriate. And like, if they're going slow, don't do that. You know what I mean? No, you gotta you move keep the process. game moving. As yeah. long as the thing that makes me salty is not card specifically. It's players not moving on through. You know what I mean? No. Yeah. If you're dwelling every second and you're doing take backs every second, if you take back a whole bunch of times, that'll make me a lot more salty. And not saying that I never do take backs, but if your turn gets so incoherent because you're taking stuff back and you're taking forever and you're going inside and out, that'll make me salty way quicker than any individual card would. I would put this less salty than obliterate less salty than dockside extortionist is Definitely. where i would put this yeah all right the next one is turgrid tegrid god of fright turgrid this is three and two black for a god that's a four five with menace uh it's a legendary creature this is typically a, a commander which is i think why people have a problem with it whenever an opponent sacrifices a non-token permanent or discards a permanent card you put that card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control I think a lot of players don't like getting their shit stolen. In general, that is a theme that we'll see, is yeah. taking taking people's turns, taking... 
people's cards, playing someone else's deck is not something that people want to happen. Do you think that the ban list should be altered to reflect that more? No, because I love taking people's cards and playing okay. with people's cards. I <laughs> yeah. love Atali. Yeah. Like the blue, black Mr. Steal Your Girl decks. Yeah. I love those decks. Yeah. I always have loved those decks from like playing Legacy Cube online. I agree. Yeah. I'm a big fan of it as well. I don't find cards like this salty, but. Again, I understand where players are coming from. They don't want their shit stolen. That's the game, though. That's kind of what... That's the game. I don't know. I don't... I don't want cards banned because they make people salty. That is the purpose of the of the commander ban list, though, is for their curating a fun experience, not a balanced one. I think that your play group is going to do a better job at curating the experience that you want out of commander than just a commander ban list is going to do. Like, I think the commander ban list should be looked at as more like guidelines, the way that it's yeah. intended to be. You should actually be having rule zero conversations with your table. And I know this is easier when you have friends to play with regularly than it is if you're playing with people online or at like playing with randos at an LGS too. But if like, if you have the ability to curate your group, like, the way that commander works is that you can say, hey, we don't play these cards because they don't fit with the spirit of what we're trying to do. And that's essentially what we've done with our play group. And we're having a fucking blast with it. Are there any cards? I mean, we have I have my casual ban list of the cards that I don't play in casual. Are there any cards besides that list like that you specifically don't play or just like we talked about before is just like CDH cards, CDH cards. And like I will typically stay away from Cards that the format in general tends to not want to see, like Armageddon and Ravages of War. I won't play them in casual, but at the same time, I don't want to see them banned in the format. Just because no one's playing them doesn't mean we should smack them on the ban list. Again, I think that's something that we can self-police, and the smaller the ban list the better. Yeah, I think I agree. As long as everyone sticks to the themes of their deck, I think it's it's totally 100% fine because I agree. I don't want the things banned because Armageddon in an Avacyn deck where eight mana Avacyn and you have all your permanents are indestructible, that's great. That's, that's fucking awesome. Honestly, you should do that. I would be super excited about that because I know then, hey, the game's wrapping up. Right. Like They have all they have this 8-8 eight, eight flyer in play that's going to kill all of us pretty quickly after this. We're not going to be able to come back. They were the only one that knew about it. So I, I understand the need for some of these salty cards to exist because in the right deck it's fun it's unique experiences I, I like watching other decks go off i think it's more better if the play groups are self-policing themselves and if you're able to just have productive rule zero conversations at the beginning of games i think that's going to be more effective than trying to ban a bunch of cards should we talk about the next salty card let's move on from turgrid we didn't even really talk about Turgid too much, but we just <laughs> talked about more about people getting their stuff stolen. The next one is Vorinclex, Voice of Hunger. This is six and two green for a seven, six with trample. It says whenever you tap a land for mana, add one mana to your mana pool of any type of land that produced. Now, see, eight mana creatures are never going to make me salty. Oh, so th there's another line that makes people yeah, salty. So, yeah. yeah. It says whenever an opponent taps a land for mana, that land doesn't untap during its controller's next untap stat. Yeah. Vorniclex is great. It's one of the most powerful green yeah. creatures in all of Commander. It's Absolutely. a finisher. It's a finisher, though. People like, hate finishers is what we're real learning. Yeah. Like eight mana creatures never going to make me salty. Mana Crypt might make me a little bit salty. A zero yeah. mana artifact that speeds you up two turns from turns one, that'll make me a little salty. Yeah, that's going to make me more salty than seeing a Vorinclex. Again, if I see a Vorinclex, I know. That's awesome. Fuck That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. This player's trying to win the game and progress it to the end without, I think, going too far overboard. And especially with cards like Vorinclex that you can't play in CDH. There's no other home for them. They, this is where they this go. This is its home. You, you yeah. What, I mean? else, like, what else am I going to do with what this? What else do you do with the expropriates that aren't good enough for CDH? Expropriate is just not good enough. Now, like, if you played Ad Nauseam in casual, there I'll be salty. There, you know what I'll, I mean? Yeah. But <laughs> if it's a, th this is where these cards are for. Expropriate and Vorinclex, this is where they live. This is their home. Yeah, exactly. And put, put them in your deck. The card makes you salty. Yeah, you should play it. You should play it. Yeah. Now, like, I, I, am I playing the cards on this salt list? Probably not. I'm probably not playing them in a lot of my decks. A, because they don't fit a theme. And if a ring clicks doesn't fit the theme, I'm not throwing it in 99% of my green decks then. So Yeah, I don't play any of these cards that we talked about so far. But if I had a turns casual deck, I would certainly play Vorniclex. And if I had a green big creature stompy deck, I would certainly play Wait, I think I said that wrong. If I had a turns deck, I would definitely play Expropriate. And if I had a green stompy deck that wanted Vornclex, I would play it for I sure. I would play it, yeah. The number five saltiest card in Commander is Armageddon. We talked about is, this one. Which is funny to me that Ravages of War, which is literally the same thing, is not in the top ten. Yeah, I guess I that guess one just 
doesn't see play as much. I guess the thought is you spend $150 on that card, you can destroy all my lands. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Again, if you're winning the game, like if you're playing Avacyn, like I'm all about it, but I don't think this is just going to go in anyone's deck. I think this card has been soft banned in the format. And I think because of that, you don't need to put it on the ban list. Yeah. I, I've kind of feel the same. Yes. If all my lands got blown up, would I be a little salty? Sure. But like, that's the game. Sometimes, intri- yeah, that's the puzzle you got to find your way out of. We're going to skip to the third saltiest card and talk about Thassa. I'm doing this for a reason, okay. uh, we're, but we're going to talk about Thassa's Oracle real quick because this is the third sure. saltiest called in, card in the format. Now we're getting closer to where my salt level would be. If you are using Thoracle to win in a game that I thought we were playing casual in, I would be like, okay, we're not doing exactly the same thing. You know what I mean? Like th- This is slowly where I'd start to get. Now, if you're playing it with your Merfolk deck just to like, like scry a little bit, that's obviously fine. Yeah. But if you're winning the game with this one, I don't know if I assault is the term that I would use, but I would I would say that we have had a lack of communication. What about like a blue green self mill deck that like its only win condition is milling its whole library and jamming Thassa's Oracle? So here is I have an AC lands deck that I've talked about before, and one of the main win conditions is manually drawing through my whole deck and casting next to fate over and over again. Now by this time, normally I have like a hundred zombies from Field of the Dead or a hundred tokens from the bug, the sc- uh, scab swarm or whatever. You're it's winning called. some way else instead of actually taking. Right. Infinite but turns. there is the backup of eventually I'll draw the whole deck and I'll be able to Nexus of Fate, which feels similar to Thoracle, but the Nexus of Fate, it, to me, it feels more on theme because sometimes Nexus Fate is just an Explorer, and Explorer lets you play an extra land drop, which is exactly what I want to do in AC. So <laughs> for love, me personally... I love how we have equated time walk to explore yeah. surveil lands and they're all the same power level <laughs> exactly so like for me i wouldn't play thoracal in that blue green deck because thoracal sucks on its own all it does is win the game and like i'm specifically my main goal is not to win the game my main goal is to play magic so i want all my cards to serve a real purpose yeah. and interlink with each other so from and i also just play so much cdh but if i didn't play a lot of cdh and i had a blue green mill deck okay i can see that I would still say uh, we got a little bit of a misunderstanding here, but it's closer. Probably, yeah. If I never played CEDH, I would probably also end up soft banning this card for me, but would not be the salties if it's used in conjunction with non-CEDH win conditions, I would say, yeah. And then the final three cards on this list are all Urza cards. It's Winter Orb, Static Orb, and, well, Stasis isn't technically, but it does effectively the same thing. These are are mini Vorniclexes. People don't like being shut out of mana. Same with Armageddon. Cards that prevent people from playing the game it seems like these heavy stacks we didn't talk about like thalias or anything draneth magistrates not in the top 10 here but things that prevent people from like actually playing the cards in their hands seems to be what is hated the most i get that not for me i don't care but if i found that my play group was playing the winter orbs i would just i think start jamming more ancient grudges and stuff like that I don't know. I like the puzzle of magic. So I like the vastness of the problems that there can be. And I like the fact that there are solutions to most things as long as you're aware of it, which is why that rule zero conversation is important. I think if you tell the table, hey, I got winter orbs in this deck, but trust me, besides that, it's a casual deck. Please be prepared for the winter orbs. I can go, all right, yeah, I have a deck for that. I have something that I think could maybe handle with the winter orb style deck. Not everyone's going to have that luxury. Not everyone's going to have a deck that can handle with the Winter Orb decks in, in, in Casual Commander. So and if you're the Winter Orb player, you need to be prepared to have another deck, I would say. Yeah. yeah, Or a card to put in instead of Winter Orb, I right. would say. We, we got to remember for Casual, like, yes, I, it's not my main goal to make sure that you personally have fun. But at the same time... I do want everyone to have fun. Yeah. You know what I mean? For casual specifically, that is the goal. I don't think it's my responsibility to make sure that you as an individual have fun because that's kind of your brain and you got to make yourself have fun. But I I still am thinking about how do I create a fun experience for the people I'm playing with in CDH or in casual commander, but much more in casual commander that comes to the top of my focus. So for me, I'm not playing these one, these wonder world. What am I, what are they called? Winter orbs. Winter, war, winter <laughs> orb, winter world cards. I'm not playing them. And I, I do kind of understand why they're a, a little bit salty. Yeah, I, I can, I can get it too. When like you're here to play a game instead of just sit around and just stare at your cards. I can definitely get that. Um, but I'm with you. Like these aren't cards that I would play in my decks, but I would never tell someone, Someone to remove them from the deck. I wouldn't not play in the game because I know that someone has a winter orb in their deck. I don't want to police the fun that someone else is having. I'm I'm not the fun judge. I know what's fun for me and what I want to be doing, which is why I have to retrain my brain to think. I'm doing my thing. I'm here to return artifacts from the graveyard to my hand. I'm here to storm off and gruel. Like I'm I'm here to do the thing that my deck is supposed to do and. 
whatever my opponent's decks are doing, they're going to try to do, they're going to interact with me. I need to have that expectation that my deck is going to get interacted with, so I have to do what I can to make sure I can still do the thing that I want to do. You have to, yeah, exactly. You have to make sure that you plan for the answers to your deck. Your deck can singularly be offensively focused. You have to have defensive things in mind. So if your deck loses to any of these extra turn spells, or if it loses to any type of effect, keep in mind, maybe I should throw an extra counter spell in my deck. Maybe I should throw in an extra removal spell to make sure that I can get rid of these problem permanents that I know my deck has a hard time with maybe trouble in pairs ends up actually being a really good casual card too because on top of being great interaction it also stops one of the saltiest win conditions in the format the solving of the puzzle is the part that's interesting to more interesting to me yeah. than figuring out what cards should be banned i know we talked a little bit about that but i'd much rather think about how do i beat the card than how, you know what does the format look like if the card is banned that's the thing like the the format is self-policing enough and especially once you get to the point where you're playing with regular players you know what to expect and your play group will start to metagame against these other decks so you do start to run more ancient grudges and you start to run more like one mana removal so that you can work around winter orb only and tapping one of your lands at a time right yeah like you you kind of evolve with your playgroup as opposed to needing to police every single playgroup by saying, you know what, we're just going to ban these cards. Yep, I, I, totally, I totally agree. Yeah. Cool. Casual is cool. I'm glad we talked about it. I got some thoughts out. I'm hoping to do some more casual on the channel. If you want to see more casual, let us know. If you want to see no more casual and only other CCDH, also let us know. And thank you for watching or listening. If you'd like to support us directly, you can do so on Patreon like our $100 patrons. Our $100 patrons are Sean in the Ice, Mark Cirillo, She Doesn't Even Go Here, SoCal Acura, Stormageddon, Luke Cook, AJ Albosebi, Demon of Rosgris, Uncle Butts, Kawaja A. Hamid, Lauren Connell, and Baby G Bus. If you want to pick up any of our merch, you can do that at playtowinmtg.com. Huge shout out to Dragon Shield. Thank you so much for supporting the show. Make sure you use our affiliate link down below and code playtowin5 to get 5% off your order. If you you want to find any more content of ours you can do that at tiktok twitter and instagram thank you so much for watching see you next time the 50 dollars patrons are tyler watson brian barrington zachary colson tyler h x tyler the tree x small craft driving crooner jabaha mace the ace dalton poteet kadanis hobo ghost Mitchell Shepard, Justin, Man Solo, Pedro, Jacob Depp, Michael Ballou, Jan Wildfang, Thomas Bueno, and David Nelson. How do my lips look? Not too dry? Sometimes it looks like I'm so thirsty.